Okay, we're live. My name is Emily Lesak, and I am the Senior Research Community Officer on the Wikimedia Foundation Research Team. I'd like to welcome you to this month's research showcase. Our showcases are monthly convenings organized by members of our team to recognize and share recent research on or relevant to the Wikimedia projects. For those of you who are joining live, we welcome you to ask questions in the YouTube chat or on IRC. We'll be monitoring these channels and we'll pass questions to the speakers at the end of their presentations. And we kindly ask that attendees follow the friendly space policy and the universal code of conduct. Before we begin, we have a community announcement to share. Uh, we're excited to announce that the 10th edition of Wiki Workshop will be held as a standalone virtual event on May 11th. We'll be releasing the CFP in the coming days. Uh, this year, we are soliciting a two-page extended abstract, and the submission deadline will be March 23rd. We invite you to keep an eye on our website, wikiworkshop.org, for updates. And now I'll pass it over to my colleague, Pablo, who will introduce this month's theme and speakers. Thanks, Emily. I'm Pablo Aragon, a research scientist at the Wikimedia Foundation, and I'm glad to introduce the February 2023 uh, research showcase. Uh, our showcase today uh, will be a bit different from the usual showcases. So typically we showcase uh, recent research focused on Wikimedia projects, mostly Wikipedia, but also Wikidata, Commons. Uh, however, we felt it was relevant to acknowledge that uh, Wikimedia is part, is an important pillar uh, of a broader free and open uh, knowledge movement. So for this, for this session, uh, we were curious about research on other relevant projects that create common knowledge in order to explore and discuss together how fundings from this research uh, could be applied to Wikimedia. And for such a challenge, we have outstanding researchers today. Uh, first, Benjamin Herford, a research associate at the Heidelberg Institute for Geoinformation and Technology, where he's conducting his PhD. Uh, will present his work on evolution of humanitarian mapping in OpenStreetMap, one of the most paradigmatic uh, free open knowledge projects. And in particular, he will introduce challenges on completeness and inequalities in OpenStreetMap, something that, in my opinion, is very related to our work on, on knowledge gaps in Wikimedia. Then, uh, Laura Koston, <coughs> a postdoctoral, postdoctoral researcher at the University of Vienna in the research group for visualization and analysis, uh, will present her research on what makes data reusable in practice. Like, is free open data enough? She will show us the gap between principles and actionable insights that might allow uh, data publishers and tool designers to implement functionalities that facilitate uh, reusability of data. So after it's all, we'll have uh, 10 minutes for discussion. And we are happy to take your questions in the chat in YouTube on IRC. I will monitor the channels and relay the questions uh, during Q&A. And with this, uh, I'll uh, pass it on to Benji. Yes, OK. So let me share my screen and already thank everyone for, for yeah this really kind invitation and nice introduction. I'm, I'm really happy to to be able to to talk about this as you put out already so i'm currently doing my phd and what i'm going to present to you is a bit of a wrap up what i've been working on in the past years and i think it's a really really good exercise to try to explain it in simple words to a broader audience so what are we going to look at in the next roughly 20 minutes so first as put out already, it will be about OpenStreetMap and OpenStreetMap data and how it is complete or biased towards certain parts of the world. And this analysis I've conducted not alone, but many other people have been involved in that analysis. Um, I put a few names here on the slides, but there are many more colleagues in, in Heidelberg that, that helped me to, to conduct the analysis of the data, but also many people in the various OpenStreetMap communities to which I could speak in the past years to really find out what actually matters to us all, let's say, as the, the broader OSM community. So let's start with the easy things, right? So OpenStreetMap, what is it? 
I'm, I'm pretty sure many of you have already heard about OpenStreetMap. Some of you might have used it. Some even used it without noticing. But first of all, right, it's, it's a map. So you can look at it online. You can print it out if you like. You can find your way. You can do various things with that map. But the map maybe is only the, the most obvious thing OpenStreetMap is. Another thing I would say probably the, the most important part of it is that this map is created by a community. And it's honestly not a single community, but it's a community of many, many small communities, some bigger, some smaller, that together work on the same map. So maybe this is in a way similar to how Wikipedia works, but also a bit different that in OSM, we might have different communities, but still everyone works on the same map, right? They are not different versions of OpenStreetMap, there's one OpenStreetMap. And you can do that by probably one million different ways how you can contribute to OpenStreetMap. You can just go out with your phone or a GPS device, collect data, upload it to OpenStreetMap, which, yeah, could be a point of interest or, or whatever, like a restaurant, whatever you like, right? You can also sit at home at your computer, look at satellite imagery and trace roads or trace buildings, right? So you do not always need to be at the place where you will do the mapping. OpenStreetMap is also a database, right? So here on this view, you see kind of that, as a, as a sketch of how the data behind OpenStreetMap looks like. So you have many points, lines, yeah, different types of data structure. You have a lot of attributes, so all the thematic information that you add to these elements that you put into OpenStreetMap. For instance, here on the right-hand side, this is where I'm working, um, the Heidelberg Institute for Geoinformation Technology. And for the text, you see that, yeah, there's quite a lot of different information captured for objects in OpenStreetMap, or put it more precisely, there's a potential that a lot of information is captured, but of course it must not be always the case that everything is mapped, right? Here also like a, um, a small thing, also there are links between projects. So for, for this uh, special case here, this point is also linked to a data entry in Wikidata. Yeah, so they're cross, cross reference. Mm. So now we have what OpenStreetMap is in general. So it's, it's global, many different people around the world contribute to it. Um, what I'm going to take a look at in particular is, let's say, yeah, a sub part of that. It's not so easy to define, to be honest, but broadly speaking, we call it humanitarian mapping. And humanitarian mapping, yeah, comes with a motivation and the motivation often lies in the fact that geodata or maps, simply speaking, are not available in all parts of the world. But at the same time, OpenStreetMap offers us, let's say, the opportunity to create these missing data sets or these missing maps. And this goes hand in hand with, with many other different motivations why people do mapping in OpenStreetMap. So not only volunteers do map in OpenStreetMap, also other kind of actors, it could be humanitarian organizations, it could be companies, do map in OpenStreetMap and try to fill the data gaps, right? So, and they do it for, for various purposes, for allowing better monitoring of progress towards the SDGs. So, what part of the urban population lives in informal settlements? This question, you can try to answer with data from OpenStreetMap, right? And this data is being created by communities that also need these answers probably. Or who has access, or maybe the other way around, who has no access to public transport? This is also something which is a question OpenStreetMap data can be really helpful for. If it exists, right? If you have the streets, if you have the, the bus stops and all the other information related to public transport. In the domain of public health, we've seen many big humanitarian organizations from the Red Cross world or Doctors Without Borders relying on OpenStreetMap data because there is no other data set they could use, right? And they use it to support communities affected by Ebola or other diseases or COVID-19, right? Um, 
So there's a mix of, of many motivations why people do mapping in OpenStreetMap. And I think this has kind of triggered a bit a movement with which I put under the umbrella of humanitarian mapping. And one organization, the humanitarian OpenStreetMap team, has yeah, created a website that is used or a tool that is used to facilitate mapping an open street map with many people. And that has happened several times in the past. Um, very early, like the first humanitarian mapping activation, so to say, might have been in 2010 after the Haiti earthquake. But since then, if you look at this figure here, um, 2013, 14, you could say it kicked off, so to say, that a larger number of people got involved into mapping activities in response to yeah, disaster events around the world. So the first very big event was a typhoon Haiyan response, Nepal earthquake in 2015. And since then, continuously, whenever something happens and geodata is missing for these regions, the humanitarian mapping community starts to create the missing data often with the help of satellite data, satellite imagery, but not always. Also at the very moment in response to the earthquake in, in Turkey and Syria, a lot of data, roads, buildings are added to OpenStreetMap, right? To help organizations that want to respond to the, the, the earthquake damage or help people on the ground. Mm. But what we took a look at is, so we know that there's a great potential but still, you need to acknowledge that this potential is not, yeah, let's say, used the same everywhere, or there are some barriers towards this potential in some other regions. So on the left-hand side, what you see on, on, this, on this world map here is the amount of road data that exists in OpenStreetMap. Yeah, and you see the, the darker colors that there's a lot of amount, mostly at the moment here in Western Europe, maybe Northern America, and also in many other parts of the world, right? Um, on the right-hand side, you see kind of highlighted all the contributions that have been made through the hot task manager tool. So one tool which is used for humanitarian mapping activations. And you see that this has a particular spatial footprint. In this case, many of these data yeah, entries have been created in Africa, but not always. You see the same for buildings, right? So you, you already see from these maps, okay, there might be some, some bias in the spatial distribution, right? So you see a lot of buildings or roads being mapped in Western Europe and not to the same extent in other parts of the world. Although I did not put this map here, maybe I should have, um, from the distribution of the population. So how many people do live in India, in China, compared to how many people live in Europe, right? You would actually expect the same amount of buildings also in these places, but you don't see them in OpenStreetMap. So this was a bit the, the first task for us, I would say, actually work with this huge data set that you get from OpenStreetMap, understand yeah, how it is distributed around the world, and then take these results and, and think about, is there anything maybe unfair in here or any bias in here. And so what did we find was that, first of all, in regions with very high human development index, that's the SHGI is the subnational human development index. So we could break it down, not only national, but a bit further. Um, you see that 20% of the global population live in regions that are classified as a, with a very high human development. But these regions account for roughly 60% of all buildings in OpenStreetMap and 65% of all road data in OpenStreetMap, right? So already this, this should give you a hint at that these regions are covered a bit better. On the other hand, you see that regions that are in the middle kind of medium human development make up for a large part of the global population, 36% but only cover a relatively small part of the data you see in OpenStreetMap, right? And finally, you see that in regions with low human development, it's roughly speaking for the buildings, account more or less also similar to the 
share of the global population for these regions, but for the roads, it might be a bit less. Um, so what can we learn from, from this very first analysis? Um, so one thing is, so the, the pattern we see, I think it's not random, right? So, and the humanitarian mapping efforts, the one we've seen on the first map, they made OpenStreetMap more inclusive. They help to build communities to add data in regions where eventually nobody ever would have mapped something in OpenStreetMap, right? So these humanitarian mapping efforts helped to make OSM more diverse, to expand the spatial footprint, right, to, to other areas beyond Western Europe, Northern America, and, and other regions. And what we could also do, we can quantify the mismatch between how much OpenStreetMap data we observe in, in the OSM database and how many people live in a certain region, right? This is, I think, the first step towards finding out like yeah, the bias in OpenStreetMap. And I think last thing we, we, we noticed by, by taking a look a bit closer at the data is that it is not only about like populating a database and putting all the data into the OSM database, but often what we've seen from successful projects that added data in places where, yeah, eventually not, nobody would have ever mapped something. You see that these examples show like often an aspect of a community that has been supported, a community building and so on, right? So it's often more than just adding data to OpenStreetMap. It's a building local communities that can facilitate this. And this is a difficult task, to be honest, because um, the model of how OSM communities are organized in, let's say, Germany, where I am based, and in other parts of the world is different in some cases because people have different motivations and have different time available to do mapping in their free time. Sometimes it's paid and so on, right? So it's there's not one model fits it all for how to organize an OSM community. And this is what we also see in our data. Okay, let's take this um, one step further. And so far we only took a look at how much OSM data there is, but we actually never talked about how much data would you expect, right? So that is the second part that, that I've been working on recently. We wanted to put into perspective the number of buildings we see in OpenStreetMap and the number of buildings you would expect based on how many people there live, right? And so this is the results of, of this map here, where you see all the bigger cities in the world. So it's around 13,000 cities cities that have, roughly speaking, more than 50,000 inhabitants should be covered. Um, and you see, first of all, a similar picture, but now you see also the missing parts, right? So remember the first map we had at one of the initial slides? The places here in, in China or India would have just been blank spots on the map. Now we can put actually a dot there and say, yeah, here is a big city, and buildings are missing, right? So the task here was more about like identifying the gaps and making them visible. Yeah. On the other hand, this map makes it also much easier to highlight the places where local communities or communities exist that do create a lot of map data, right? For instance, we see it in Tanzania, we see it in Uganda, we see it in the Philippines, we see it in many countries in Western Europe. And also sometimes we see it within countries that a few cities are mapped and a lot of OSM data exists there because there is a local community that yeah, takes care of this, so to say. Mm, we can put this also into a temporal perspective. So how did this evolve over time? And this might not be surprising, but we see that especially in Europe and Central Asia and North America, Mapping has started relatively early, so to say. So that's where OpenStreetMap was yeah, starting from. And you clearly see this in the data, right? And you also see that it's a challenge, I would say, to keep up with, with the pace and not make 
the difference is now some bigger and bigger, right? In Sub-Saharan Africa, we have seen a lot of mapping effort, efforts recently, whereas in other parts of the world, we could say that there is still a lot of data missing um, where we might not have found or where there's not clear what is the best way to organize a local OSM community or how it's not clear what is the, yeah, how should the local community look like in some places? Yeah, or it's not so easy. Mm. Let me, yeah, put one last aspect, many, maybe. Um, so we have looked at different scales. So I'm, I'm also a geographer, so scale is always important for us. So what we've uh, looked at was the global scale, right? So we compared different parts of the world, we compared different cities. And I want to guide your uh, attention also to the fact that even within one city, you can see big differences, right? So here, this is the city of Dar es Salaam in Tanzania. And you we will see now how OSM looked like at different points in time. And the darker blue the map gets, the more complete the buildings are, right? And now we are in 2015. And in 2015, basically, only very few parts of the city, a building was mapped. If you compare this to 2017, you see that the core part of the city was almost everything was mapped in regard to buildings there. And if you jump to 2019, you could say maybe the entire city got mapped. And so we do not only see differences on the global or regional scale, we also see inequalities or differences within the city scale, right? And this is what yeah, you need to keep in mind when you work with open street map data. And this is my last slide. So what are the implications of the second part of the analysis? So we know that there are inequalities in OSM. And it's important that you assess these potential negative impact of missing data, right? If you want to use OSM data, you should investigate if your analysis, your study, or just simply your map is subject to this spatial bias caused by the fact that just nobody mapped data in OpenStreetMap there. And this missing data or this uneven spatial coverage, it happens at multiple scales, right? It can be an issue for you for a, a national or a country map, but it might be no problem if you just want to have your neighborhood map, right? And this is the tricky part I would say about yeah, understanding OpenStreetMap as a ecosystem map community database mix. And but on the good side, once you know and you can yeah, account for the biases in OpenStreetMap's coverage, right? Then as a researcher or anybody who wants to use the data, you can draw the right conclusions and you can avoid giving misleading recommendations, right? So once you can quantify where data is missing, you can yeah, take this into account before you tell about somebody, hey, do this and that. And spend a lot of, lot of money on whatever, right? If you are into creating open treatment data, so if you are part of the OSM community or if you want to get involved with an OSM community, right? I think you should also use completeness map, so the map like I, the one I showed before, maybe to decide where more mapping is needed that you could support, right? So to yeah, to ensure that nobody is left behind as it's encouraged by the SDGs, the Sustainable Development Goals. And one last aspect, I would say a topic which is also affecting OpenStreetMap, but maybe also many other communities, is yeah, automated data creation, machine learning, deep learning. And from my personal perspective, the cultural, cultural openness and social nature of OSM, so as a community, right? I, I would consider this as a strength when you compare it to other data sets, which are maybe derived use, using proprietary black box machine learning approaches for which we do not know bias and fairness, right? For sure, we know that also OSM is not unbiased and it's not 100% fair, right? But still, it's easier 
for us to quantify and understand, I would say then for many of the machine learning approaches where we still need to do that work. Yeah. Thanks for listening. And um, yeah, I'm excited to hear your questions or thoughts. And yeah, that was a talk. Okay. <clears throat> Thank you very much, Benjamin. This was very exciting. I have uh, several questions, uh, but I don't know if there is uh, first anyone in the room who wants to go first with questions. Yeah, I can I can start with uh, my question. Actually, first I want to start with a comment, which is I love the figure from your nature paper that you showed. Uh, Emily, who's also in the room, and I have worked on helping kind of write up um, how to think about comparing Wikipedia language editions across uh, different, well, I guess, different languages for researchers. And this sort of figure where you can say like, here's how some of the data is maybe connected to, you know, events that happened within the community or tools that became available. Um, I think a really powerful way of showing those connections. And so I'm, I'm now very inspired to think about what that sort of figure looks like for, for Wikipedia. So, so thank you. Um, as for the actual question, I think you touched on this a bit, but I wanted to make explicit, I think, a parallel I draw between what you're describing for humanitarian open street map um, and like the community of campaigns and organ organizing that happens um, among the Wikimedia projects. Um, and so one of the big questions for us when we think about kind of content gaps on the projects is how to close those gaps. Um, and I think two kind of large or like common approaches folks think about. One is kind of like reducing the barriers, making editing just generally easier and hoping that through that process, um, we're able to close content gaps. And I think the other approach is really saying like, no, we need to focus on campaigns. Like campaigns that you described humanitarian open street map are this kind of proven mechanism for closing gaps. Um, and this is something that I think Alex Stinson, who's at the foundation, has laid out very nicely in a series of blog posts, and we'll share that um, link for those who are interested. Um, and one of the things he talks about there is an the importance of kind of providing organizers with the tools to make building campaigns and recruiting folks to work on these campaigns easier. So I was wondering, from your experience with humanitarian open street map, if you have any thoughts on like what has worked well within that community for supporting those efforts and maybe what hasn't worked so well too. Mm -hmm. um, very good question. And I think it's, it's really interesting to see the, the connections to, to Wikimedia projects. So I think, okay, what worked well in the humanitarian mapping community, I will go back to the very, here to this one, is at least in the past, I would say these big activations, how they're called, these big campaigns, when there was an urgency of after the Nepal earthquake, people need maps to support um, the, the disaster response activities. I think these mapping efforts often worked very well in the regard that many people got engaged in a very short time and the data gaps could be filled within a few days, right? The downside of this is that sometimes you cannot plan or maybe smaller smaller scale disasters got forgotten right this is the downside of campaigns i would say where where i would be a bit um yeah waving a bit this be careful campaigns will not solve everything because what we've i think what we've learned from from the examples here the examples nepal is a very good example but also many other places the best or the, the, the best yeah, results you actually get when there already is a local community which knows how mapping should be done, which can coordinate efforts and maybe get support from, from a more global humanitarian mapping community. So, and how do you reduce these barriers, right? To how can you start local mapping communities? And this is, this is not easy, I would say. Mm, two approaches which, which I, I think work quite well is on one hand is, is micro grants. So give people the financial means to start their local community. So they can apply for a micro grant for the whole humanitarian open street map team, but also other NGOs have done that. And you can just get a little bit of money 
to, I don't know, buy a few GPS devices or smartphones, rent a space to, to get your own mapping community started, right? So this one is, I think, a successful approach. Another one would be the example of, of use mappers that are really successful in building a network of student groups across, I think, several hundred universities around the globe where students map, come together and map, but they do not only map, they do more, right? They, they build skills, they learn how to use GIS, they learn how to create maps. I think this is a very interesting approach to, yeah, to reduce the barriers, to really like get in many different places, bring people together. Like that's what I see as, as really successful at the moment. Yeah. Thank you. Yeah, that makes a lot of sense where I guess the parallels for us are thinking about, yeah, making sure that you're laying the groundwork with a local community before encouraging lots of campaigns around that space to make sure that there's, yeah, community to kind of incorporate that work and say, yeah, what is actually important here? Um, and then it makes a lot of sense too about the kind of youth mapping or the yeah, educational, I know like wiki edu and there's certain organizations that really focus on, on that side of things too. Thank you. Thank you. I see Martin also has a question. Yes, I would like to, to follow up. First of all, thanks Benjamin for this presentation. Uh, very interesting. And I would like to follow up on Isaac's question that uh, you dis just mentioned that there's these external or catastrophes and I've almost like external events that create this urgency. And I'm curious if you have any uh, notion of how sustained the involvement of the editors is, because we see, like, let's say with big external events, you could say like COVID for, is a very good example that triggered a lot of involvement, but, um, there's always the question around how, how we can, another problem is like one is to how to get people to start editing and contributing. The other question is about retaining them and so that they stick around. So I'm curious if, yeah, if you know anything about that, how, how this works in that case and how well or not well. Yeah, mm -hmm. curious to you. Um, also, thanks for that question. Um, it's basically when I got involved to, to mapping an open street map around, I think, yeah, shortly before uh, the Typhoon Haiyan happened in the Philippines in 2013, that was also the question that, that we had after that activation, right? Now, everyone was engaged, everyone was mapping, but how many people would actually stay? And whenever something happens in the future, would be still there and could share that knowledge from yeah, how it was organized a few months ago. Um, I think a good example how this was tackled is the Missing Maps Projects, which is a collaborative of different humanitarian organizations, but not all only. So it's the German Red Cross is part now, the American Red Cross, Doctors Without Borders, many other NGOs are involved there that wanted to keep this momentum, but put it into the long run because the data gaps they are there all the time, right? So you do not need to wait for something to happen to fill these data gaps. So you do not need to wait for an event to happen to start building a community. And this is a bit the, the perspective of the Missing Maps project. So what we've seen in the past is these disaster response activities, the, yeah, the amount of people that come back is relatively low, yeah? And campaigns like Missing Maps, which have a more, a longer lasting perspective that are not as much about disaster response, but more about disaster risk reduction. So something you do ahead of a disaster that they were more successful in yeah, building a community. And still, I think that that's maybe for, for most of these projects, open treatment, but probably any crowdsourcing project is you need to acknowledge that 80% or even more of the people will only do mapping for one day, right? And they will never come back. Um, and this is, this is part of the reality, but still it's worth the effort to try to keep new people engaged and 
yeah, the remaining 20% that stay around a bit longer, I think they can have a very big impact. Okay, thank you, Benjamin. I have a, a lot. There are no more questions. I have maybe a last question. Okay, so, uh, well, first, thanks uh, again for the presentation. Like, uh, in the team, like my colleagues are, are working in this knowledge gap index. So, it will be a tool that will help to measure, like, for instance, in terms of content gaps, in terms of geography, gender, sexual orientation, time, and local content. But also there are, in the case of Wikimedia, there are really like great tools by the community. I'm thinking about tools like uh, Humanikil, the Wikimedia Diversity Dashboard tool. I, I was going to ask you about tools for measuring biases on OpenStreetMap, but you, I saw the, the screenshot and you introduced this awesome dashboard. Uh, so I'm, I'm curious, like, what is the design process of these kind of tools? Like, in particular, how to bring community knowledge in the design of these tools to measure uh, biases? Okay, tough question. <laughs> um, let me, like, okay, how to, to answer that. The difficult part here, I would say, is for any bias, or it's a bit, if we put it a bit more technical, it's a question of data quality, right? How good is the data? You need to involve the communities or the people that, that either want to use the data or that want to create the data, um, because only then you can find out which aspects of the data actually need to be complete, right? So here we looked at buildings. Um, you can add more information to buildings, how many stores they have, what's the purpose of a building, right? So in, in that aspect, you need to talk to people, um, definitely, and you need to understand, yeah, first, why do they do map actually? And maybe it's good enough to not map every building, right? So, so that aspect for sure. When I'm talking to, to many um, parts of the humanitarian OpenStreetMap community, it's also often about making visible what you achieved, right? Because of course the, the gaps are also huge still, but that's okay if you can show that you filled a small part of it and you can say, this is what we did, right? We increased the completeness of buildings in Dar Salam between 2015 from probably 5% to 2019 to more than 80%, right? If you can tell this, and this is what I'm talking with, with many people in the humanitarian community about, if we can find these stories and we can talk the stories through data, I think this, this, this can motivate people, but it also helps them to show, yeah, what they achieved. And this is how I try to, to approach it. So if there are people listening, I don't know, get in contact with me and, and share your question and thoughts. And I'm, I'm really happy to, to listen and, and learn from them. Excellent, thank you. Okay, so thanks again for your presentation. And now it's time for Laura for our second talk. Hi, can you see my screen? Yep. Great. And yes. you can hear me, okay. Okay, excellent. Yeah, um, thanks. Uh, thanks so much for the invite. Um, as, uh, as Pablo mentioned, my name is Laura Kasten, um, and I'm a postdoc at the University of Vienna currently um, in a research group for uh, data analysis and data visualization at the Faculty of Computer Science there. Um, yeah. Thanks to everybody who is listening and also, yeah, good afternoon, morning or evening from wherever you're watching. Um, I will talk uh, about a paper today that was published in 2020 um, and a little bit about some of the work um, that I did during my PhD at the Open Data Institute in, in London, UK. Um, and before I start, I just want to mention that this work was not done by me alone, but together with my co-authors. Um, and if I manage to change slide, I will also show you. Yeah, okay. Um, so um, the main people on, on this particular paper were Pablos Bulikis, um, who is now a research scientist at Hawaii, um, but was then um, 
a PhD uh, at the University of Southampton by Professor Elena Simple from King's College London, um, a Professor Paul Groth, um, who's at the University of Amsterdam now, um, and Kathleen Gregory, um, who was involved in some of the other work that I'll be talking about, who is at a postdoc also at the University of Vienna right now and Ottawa. Okay. Um, the background of this talk uh, are going to be these two these two papers. So this uh, the main focus is going to be on data set reuse, uh, and we tried to publish uh, or we did publish a, a literature review and a case study uh, as one paper that was called uh, towards translating principles to practice. Um, the other work that is mentioned here is about um, some work that we did to understand how people actually make sense of data that they haven't created themselves and how people explain data that they did create themselves to other people first within their own disciplinary domain and then to other people outside their kind of direct field of work. So this is a little bit of a different type of project. Um, also in comparison to, to the talk we've heard before. Um, and so I just want to set the scene by saying when, when I talk about data, I primarily think about data sets. So that's tables, CSV files, tabular type of data that doesn't exclude kind of large collaboratively maintained databases, which are super amazing, successful projects. I think of, that of data reuse, but that's not what we had in mind here with, with this particular study. Um, and to make it even more precise, when I when I say data reuse, I mean the act of using data which others have created for any type of purpose, um, often for a different purpose than these data sets have originally been um, intended for. Um, yeah, to give you a bit of an outline, I'll start with the motivation of this work uh, and what we what we saw in the literature. Um, and then I'll talk about some of the findings um, and exemplify them in a case study uh, and briefly go through some takeaways. So in terms of what, what we can learn from this and um, where should it go? All right, so in, in terms of motivation, um, we know that the value of data increases the more, the more they are used. And there are increasingly also kind of regulatory incentives for data sharing, um, for publishing data that, that we produce, research data, but also other types of data. Um, it's required by funders, by publishers all around, um, also op open governmental data sharing uh, is, is a thing. And the idea is um, amongst many other things to accelerate scientific discovery, to you know, support innovation and so on. So the, the kind of the, motiv the motivations for, for data sharing are sort of widely known. Um, but what we also know is that making data available requires an investment, an investment on, on the side of the person who's, who's publishing the data, who's making it available, um, but also on the side of the data publishers. So in, in terms of if, if we, if we publish data that we produce, the idea is that it would be good that it would be used as widely as possible. Um, however, um, we actually know very little about how data sets are used for other purposes. Um, and I think in, in terms of we know little, I also mean that we have very little measurable evidence on what makes a data set more reusable compared to others. And there are initiatives in that direction, different really interesting developments in terms of data citations. Um, this is not what this work is about. And I think th they are great, but we also know that data citations um, sort of notoriously under underestimate data reuse. Um, this is work that uh, was published by, I think, Lily Hem Hemphrey and co uh, um, and, and co-authors. Um, so yeah, um, but but going back to to our definition of of reuse and how it can be measured, our main motivation that we was that we thought was actually quite difficult. Um, not only in terms of what we measure, but also our understanding of what it is that actually makes data sets easier to use um, than others. Um, 
Yeah, I do want to say that this is obviously different in some communities compared compared to others. Some communities, some disciplinary domains are better at reuse and at attributing data uh, and their producers. Um, but the focus of this paper was that we wanted to look at general purpose scenarios for kind of what are the guidelines that could be operationalized broadly, what it is that I should do as a person who publishes data or what it is that a data publisher as a in terms of a whole repository should do, what are the things that should be tracked and that can be linked to reuse. Um, the other metric we often have in repositories, which, which funnily we didn't have in this study, was it would be data set downloads. Um, and there we know from Borgman and co-authors that downloads actually often overestimate reuse. Um, in any case, um, what, what we found in several sort of empirical work also qualitatively with people who publish data, with people who work with data with, and with people who work in, in data repositories, for a reuse to actually happen, we need to actively support people in understanding and working with the data. Um, so this is when we started with the literature review for this work. Um, and so maybe one, one more thing I want to mention here is that, in fact, we sort of know that just putting data out there, um, so this is what I sort of mean with the open data problem or the promise or, or the context problem, having a lot of data available is great, and it's a great first step. Um, but we also know that just sharing it um, doesn't ensure that it's discoverable, it doesn't ensure that it's usable, um, and in many ways, understandable. Um, what is different to, for instance, um, the talk we've had before is that many open data sets are sort of published as kind of end products. They are you, the product published as a static product for others to browse and consume and, and maybe reuse. Um, we see this on open governmental data platforms, but also in places uh, such as Kaggle or research repositories. Um, so, yeah, to sum up, what I want to say here is that using a data set beyond the context where it originated does remain challenging for a variety of reasons. And they're not just connected to the infrastructure that publishes it, but also to kind of a variety of socio-technical reasons, um, which have been discussed in the literature and which, have, which also have been part of, of our work um, or came out of our work. Um, so what we wanted to look at is what do people actually recommend? What, what do we know from the literature? Uh, and there are a lot of papers published on, on data reuse. Um, there's a lot of guidance out there, um, at least on a very kind of general high level basis. Everybody see, or most people seem to agree that it's um, basically impossible to reuse a data set without context. Um, no one really knows what context means or everybody knows it, um, but there is no clear definition. Context is a multifaceted construct. Um, people understand different things by it. Um, but also the problem is what type of context would I need in order to reuse data if we sort of assume that people's data needs actually range in specificity. They're really closely related to my own tasks and purposes, and they might change over time. Um, so they're not a static thing. Um, so bottom line is context also means different things, um, but it seems to be very important. Um, and so looking at the literature, we thought, okay, we agreed data doesn't just become usable simply through being available. Um, but people need to have the necessary information in order to make informed decisions about whether a data set is a usable, trustworthy, relevant, and you can add adjectives here, source for whatever data task um, people are planning to do. Um, and what we found is that this guidance stays kind of quite high level and is actually quite difficult to operationalize. Um, and so we did this literature review to collect the good advice that's 
in these papers. Uh, and what we, we did it from a particular perspective. We wanted to understand what of these things that are recommended for data sets to be reusable, um, what of these things might be measurable? Um, we reviewed about 40 papers. Um, this is not a comprehensive list, but it seemed to be a very good overview that covered the sort of general purpose type advice that was out there at the time of the study. Um, and this uh, includes papers published between 1996 uh, and 2019. And there are a lot of community defined guidelines and some are more precise than others. For, for instance, for experimental data within specific research domains, there is there's a lot of precision and there's a lot of guidance. Um, but here again, the focus was on these general purpose scenarios. Um, and so for each of these papers, we looked at the principles and the guidance around processes and technologies for data sharing and reuse. And we tried to compile a list of reuse features and we grouped them into eight categories. And they're all related to the context in which the data set was created and how it's, and where it's meant to be used and the related documentation. And these categories are access, summaries and understandability, methodological choices, data quality, connections, versioning and provenance, ethics and semantics. Um, and I'll go through some of them <laughs> and not, not through all of them. Um, so, I mean, the main point here is, is documentation and documentation, we, we, we kind of split in three different parts. And one was this type of summary representations. Um, oh, it disappeared, sorry. Yeah, I, I split, uh, I skipped the slide. So let's start with access. Um, so um, elements around access, like is there, a, is there a license specified? Is the format of the data set something I can use? Is the code available that was used to create the, the data set or subsequent analysis? Um, does it have an, an, an identifier or a download link? Um, and these are described in more detail in the paper. Coming, coming back to documentation, um, the first thing we thought about summary representations, uh, these kind of higher level representations of what a data set is about. Um, that includes um, descriptions of the data, textual descriptions, like in a readme file um, that included also um, questions about the original purpose of the data set, which is useful to assess whether it's relevant or not. Summary statistics, there are approaches that actually automatically create summary statistics of data sets to help assess quality um, and, and other things, um, as well as visual representations of the data set. That also includes, um, you know, whether people understand the headers, whether abbreviations are used, um, but also questions of scope, what is actually covered in the data set. Is it, you know, the geographical scope, the temporal scope, but also the time of data collection. Um, the other thing was methodological choices, which, um, you know, that is that is mentioned a lot in literature. People need to know about the methodology, which um, reference systems were used, which, which units are represented in a data set. Um, how representative is it? Which populations does it cover? What are certain caveats uh, in terms of known limitations? Um, in terms of, and that's, what I find interesting here is that all these things are relevant on a data set level but sometimes also at a column level, right? What are the caveats with using a specific column to infer something for another column and so on? Um, what are the cleaning and pre-processing steps that have been done? Um, and and questions around data management and maintenance, how long is it gonna be available? Uh, all these things can be used to assess risk, <laughs> for instance, uh, if you decide to try, if you think about using a data set for a different task. Quality is, is uh, much discussed, of course. Um, in this sense, um, we found references to missing values, to what to the meaning of null values, to margins of error, quality control, um, outliers, um, possible options or constraints in terms of 
you know, if you if you look at a value in in a in a column, what are the actually the possible options? I don't know. Is it if it's a percentage, it should be between zero and hundred, I guess. Um, if it's um, above hundred, that means something. Maybe if you think about sensor data um, that measures something, how I don't know how full something is, and it's suddenly above a hundred percent, that is, that um, transports a meaning about maybe the functioning of the sensor. Um, just as an example, but also information about abbreviations and acronyms. Um, so the other thing that was recommended a lot that kind of goes beyond this, um, what we call documentation um, uh, is what we called ways to situate the data in the uh, data set within a wider context. Um, so, of course, it doesn't stand alone. And so he referred, we referred to connections, for instance. Um, that, that was mentioned a lot. Um, source, the sources that are cited, relationships between variables within a data set, relationships to other data sets, um, data set citations, but also contact information to the author uh, or the institution that published the data. Um, related to that was also questions of provenance and versioning, also nothing new. Um, information about the authoritativeness of the publisher, about versioning, about a version history maybe, but also ideas about prior use. Um, there's often this idea of data showcases. Um, and you could also imagine that people give advice on reuse. This is something that we saw in our, in our work on, on how people make sense of data sets. Um, it's when they explain their own data, obviously, often they say, well, but you know, in this instance, I would do this, or in this particular case, you need to be aware that this has a different meaning uh, and so on. Um, of course, the question of semantics or standardized vocabulary, vocabulary, vocabularies used to express uh, certain variables. Um, is a schema used or not? Uh, what, you know, do we have a clear common definition of what the words um, or values uh, used mean? As well as questions of ethics, which is obviously a hugely important topic, but uh, I don't have time to go into that here. And other authors have done so much, much better than we. So this is just a extremely high level summary of, of what we found uh, as these reuse features in literature. Um, and we thought, okay, it would be great to do all of these things, but we're gonna be busy with sort of documenting our data set for a long time. Um, so where, where should we start? Can we, can we do something that kind of help, helps prioritize? Imagine if you um, are <laughs> a data publishing platform, which are the things you should actually demand which are which are the things that should be required or tracked um, and we found that a lot of things are not tracked and it's actually quite difficult to 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 get these uh, kind of met to attach metrics to to these features that I've just mentioned um, yeah the idea is that if we can track some of these things and link some of these features measurably to increased reuse, one could potentially improve publishing practice and sort of iterate over the design of portals and other sharing platforms um, and main, a kind of focus maintenance work. So we try, We said, okay, let's try it out. Um, so we did a case study using, using GitHub. And uh, I will describe this case study now, but I wanna say um, that this work was led by my co-author Pavlos um, so be forgiving when it comes to the model details. Um, so we looked at around 1.4 million data files from over 65,000 GitHub repositories that all contain tabular data. This was the corpus we used for this particular case study. Um, we used, um, yeah, okay, let, let's keep it there. We used engagement metrics. Um, that GitHub offers. So um, the watchers, so which is basically if you register to receive a notification, the forks, um, if you produce a personal copy of a repository, 
um, as well as the committers um, and stars. Um, we use these as proxies for reuse. We didn't have access to downloads, uh, which would probably be a more adequate proxy. Um, but we thought, you know, if we combine these four engagement features or met uh, metrics, um, we get a, a good idea of how much a repository is, is reused. Um, what, what, is a, what is a data repository? It's, it's sort of something we defined for the purpose of this study. Um, so we had this working definition of a repository that has tabular data of a minimum size of 10 rows either in a CSV, XLSX, or XLS5 type. That's pretty limited. There are other data types out there, um, but this is what we used uh, as, a, as a corpus. And what we wanted to see is whether we could uh, create a model that predicts how likely it is that a data set is going to be reused within this corpus. So we created a neural network-based architecture that processed these different types of GitHub features. And what is interesting here is that we looked at three sources of data to populate this model. One was the repository itself um, and different features, you know, the size of the repository, the size of the data set, um, uh, and so on. <laughs> um, the number of files um, so we, we had it we had a whole list so so one was the repository the other one was the readme file um, so for instance the number of code blocks the number of tables in the readme file the length of the description um, and also there it was a number of different features um, as well as the data it themselves and for the data files themselves I, I have to say that it was pretty limited um, we looked at the number of rows and columns for each data file and we also looked uh, checked whether it would um, in terms of size and file format if we could open with with a standard configuration of um, a Python library so with, with Pondo. Um, and we combine these three sources of data um, and sort of created four groups. Um, so we, sorry, we created, <laughs> we created four groups of reuse. So looking at these engagement metrics I've mentioned earlier, we said, okay, if we look at how often a data set is reused, we created a ranked list of all of these different features to combine uh, and created four groups of reuse. And then we used these features I've described here um, to predict how likely it is that a data set would fall in one of these four categories of reuse. Um, and we actually found, um, we, we got an, an accuracy of the model of just under 60% if we combined all of these different um, sources of data. Um, so that you would see this here in the last row, if we combined uh, information from the repository, the readme and description and the data file. Um, so the accuracy here means whether a data set repository belongs to one of these four categories of reuse or not. Um, so, for context, ra a random prediction <laughs> would be 25% here, so 60s. Um, okay. Um, and what we also see here is kind of a, a progressive increase in accuracy the more features we added. Um, so, in summary, which me this means that given the characteristics of a data set, of a repository and it's readme, even though some of them are quite high level. And we could in theory go into much more detail here, especially looking at the data file. Now we can predict whether, um, especially we can predict whether this data set is gonna be in the most reused group or not. Um, 
so what this case study provides uh, is an indication that such an approach can actually help flag areas of improvement in how data sets are published, for instance, around documentation. Um, it can also, you could also imagine to monitor the uptake of openly available data sets, but, and also prioritizing those reuse features that are likely to have higher impact on engagement. So in summary, our approach consisted of these five steps. And, and while the model itself is very particular to GitHub and to particular to the engagement metrics and, um, and the features that we had available there, uh, it was created in a modular approach. So the idea would be that this is in theory um, as, a, as, a, as, a, as a prototype applicable to other contexts uh, in terms of, you know, the, the first step is we need a corpus of data set. The second would be you need to define the metrics that are used as proxies for data reuse. In this case, this was, these were the engagement metrics and the features that are used to characterize the data set. The third would be data collection and analysis um, and to create a rank, ranked list that, for instance, um, in our case, divided the data sets in terms of reuse into four different groups. Uh, then a, predict, a reuse prediction is made. Um, so essentially this would be any statistical model to predict reusability informed by the analysis that is provided in the first in the third step um, and the five uh, second last point would be to create recommendations for the specific use case um, to make this a little bit more practical what did we learn from this particular case study for our corpus from data from github um, we learned that a short textual summary of the data set actually really influences reuse. Um, so th this is something we would recommend. Um, we also saw this for a comprehensive readme file in terms of the longer the readme file was, usually the more reuse we saw. These are not causal uh, relationships, but, but these are our observations, um, as well as links to further information. Um, we also found that if data sets exceeded the standard processable file size, they were less likely to be reused. Um, that's uh, a convenience problem maybe. Um, and that the data set should be possible to open with a standard configuration of a common library, such as for instance, pandas. This also seemed to imp impact the result. Um, in any case, these are examples. These need to be tested, especially in the context of other repositories. Um, but our point here was to say, um, you know, is, is it possible with the metrics we, that are available um, to, to predict something meaningful here or not? And in our, in our case, um, it was. So to sum up, um, what we did here is we collected reusability features. Um, we created a corpus of data sets um, and a description of its characteristics as much as that was available. Um, we did this case study to understand data reuse in this particular context of this particular corpus. Um, I can't stress that enough because it's, it's different for each repository. Um, and we did an, uh, we created an initial model to predict the data set's reusability with, uh, with its highest accuracy using all the features that we had available of um, just under 60%. Mm -hmm. <laughs> so I think I'm gonna leave this here with a few questions for discussion that I would find interesting. Um, in the context of our study and in the context of data portals, uh, I think it's super interesting to think about what is the information that should, we really should add at the time of publishing to allow people to evaluate data for their purposes. And arguably GitHub is not the, not the best example. Um, but 
the other question I'm super interested in is what it what changes if we do not see data set as static and products, but but sort of as materials for other uses. Um, how is this actually reflected in in how the data or open street maps are used where this is more the case? Um, and what are ways to explore whether data is fit for reuse? Um, and how can we help future users of data to make informed decisions? With this, I just want to say thank you. Um, here's some of the references I've used in this work. Um, and yeah, if you if there's anything you'd want to chat further, um, please drop me an email. Okay, thank you, Laura, for this uh, great presentation. Uh, typically, we have like findings from from these talks. Uh, having questions from the from the speaker is not so so common. Thank you very much for doing doing that effort today. Uh, there are some no question, but some comments on on YouTube uh, acknowledging uh, actually loving your focus on actual non, non uh, not only potential reuse. Uh, I don't know if there is like. There are questions in, in the room. I, I have several. So unless someone wants to take the initiative, I can share one of them. Okay, well, my, my first question, it relates like uh, as other sub cases, mostly it's about research on Wikipedia, Wiki, uh, Wikimedia projects and typically Wikipedia. Uh, many of them focus on uh, not, not all of them, but many have focused on the English version of Wikipedia. So a common question that we have in, the, in these cases is like how much those findings can be extended to other language uh, editions, or there might be some uh, some patterns that maybe are not so cons so consistent across languages. So you mentioned like some possible limitations of, of your research that I think very interesting. One of them is like is focused on GitHub. I thought you also mentioned that it could be extended to other platforms. I was thinking like there are like, other platforms that include formally like cards, like model cards. Uh, and actually this is something that in, in Wikimedia for the machine learning models now they are including model cards to uh, facilitate reusability. So I, I, I'm curious about like how much uh, these results could apply in these other platforms that maybe have more ad hoc information for reusability of data. Mm -hmm. Thanks for the question. Um, I mean, the, the short answer, answer is, I don't know, I'd love to test it. <laughs> I think model cards are great. Um, they obviously ap apply more to models, but there's also this idea of, of data. Uh, what's the word? Data cards? Um, I feel like it's, it's the wrong word. It's research from uh, Team Nate Gebro and co-authors. Um, where not not just the model is displayed, but this uh, explained, but the but the data set is uh, is kind of documented. They um, cover a lot of the reuse features that we also found in literature, with a strong focus on ethics um, as well. Um, I think these are great um, approaches. I just really I still wonder, you know, if we we can. We can make an extremely comprehensive list of all the things that might possibly be usable, uh, help people to reuse something. But I think the question is, how do we prioritize? Because it's it's unrealistic to some extent. I mean, model cards are great because they um, there. It's about it's about the model. <laughs> it's it's a, in some ways I think it's a little bit more um, comprehensive. Um, but the for me, the question is not, you know, coming up with with more more and more ideas is great on what to document. But I think for me, the question is, how do we make this? How do we operationalize this? How do we help people to document? Um, can can some of this documentation documentation be done maybe semi semi automatically? Or should there be more and better tools for data publishers to? To supply that information, should there be, um, you know, what are different sort of innovative ways of letting people assess this information that is um, recommended, for instance, by these data or model cards? Could there be 
exploratory interfaces that help people assess what they need to know about a data set. So, yeah, so maybe that's the second part of my answer is, I think it's super hard to specify what future use or what reuse is going to have, what the purpose is going to be. Uh, and so it's very hard to do, to just create static type of information. Uh, and I think moving towards more dynamic, personalized ways of letting people assess data, that would be super interesting. And maybe to make the link to, to Wikidata, um, I, I mean, as I mentioned, this, this research had a different focus, but what I would find interesting here is to look at, I mean, Wikidata has has references to sources, right? There is a lot of work on Wikidata quality. There's some work. Um, how do we assess these sources if they are data sets? How many of these sources are, are data sets? Uh, and does that count as reuse? Uh, and I would say, yes, of course. Um, and how to, yeah, to quantify that or to measure that would be something I would find super fascinating. But I don't know the actual scale, to be honest. Thank you, Laura. Any other question in the room to Laura? I would have a question if, if it's okay. Um, I would be interested in the, the, the different, I say, magnitudes that you might have seen how data sets are used. So is it I, know, I imagine there are many data sets out there that are not out there that are not used at all. And there might be a few data sets that stand out and are extremely heavily used. And yeah. first question, maybe maybe too technical, how would that affect your model? But more like how do you incorporate that in, in your study that a few heavily used data sets might have a big impact on, on what you find there? Or could you explain us just more how yeah? How is that imbalance of data sets being used or not being used? Yeah, it is, I think, thanks for that question. I think there is a huge imbalance. We uh, took that into account by simply just creating these uh, four groups uh, and how the distribution, uh, you can also see that see that in the papers there are, I don't, I don't know the numbers right now by heart, but there are some that are heavily reused. And I think that's one of the limitations that it, um, it depends a lot on, on a community around the repository or a project. So some of the ones that were super heavily reused were connected to, uh, to, to open source software projects, of course. Um, but the way we produced these ranked lists, they were just you know amongst the top uh, 1%, um, but we tried to split the rest sort of, sort of, sort of evenly um, so that it, that, the top reuse group doesn't just cover um, these um, these few, but I think this community aspect on the one hand is a limitation um, because it influences a lot. It influences reuse a lot, but on the other hand, it's a fact. So we know that the you know communities around data sets support reuse. They facilitate reuse. Um, uh, repositories that have ways where you know where people can talk about. Um, data sets that have discussion functionalities, comments, and so on. So there is this idea of, of data communities as well. Um, and so I think that's also an interesting observation that this obviously plays a role. Um, and many data publishers go towards this type of um, you know, data showcases where you actually try to advertise data sets or try to build kind of interest around it. Um, in some ways, treating them a little bit similarly to these um, openly, open collaboratively maintained data sets such as uh, OpenStreetMap. Um, where, where I think this, this idea of looking at data sets that way is it's super interesting also for smaller scale um, projects. Um, but the culture isn't really, yeah, it, it's not really seen as that currently, I would argue. Yeah, I hope that answers your question. Okay. 
have a question of um, thinking about, yeah, this open street map and data set, you know, one of the values of open street map is how it aggregates all of these otherwise like very disparate data sets from little local government agencies and things like that. And I wonder what you think about like, what is the role of like data set aggregators? Is, do they need to play like there's, you know, open street map, you have a very specific example of that, but do we need things like that in other domains? Would that be helpful or? Yeah. That's a super interesting question. Uh, and I really don't have an answer for that, but um, I would love to think more about it. I think it depends a lot of, I think the, 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 the idea is that if there is a common, a shared task for which we aggregate, yes, um, then, then of course, and that OpenStreetMap is just such an obvious um, example and I'm sure there are many other sort of domain specific examples where that would make a lot of sense. I think there have been uh, attempts with, I don't know, clinical trials um, to sort of aggregate across studies there. Um, but yeah, I, I, do, I do think that that plays a role, but I think it's, a, it's really not non-trivial and extremely domain specific. And so, um, but it would be worth thinking about it from this type of kind of inclusiveness or community perspective um, to think about where are the areas where, where that really makes sense uh, and how much do we have to go into detail for to kind of account for the specific data cultures and norms that exist in, 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 in such um, communities. Um, but I, I don't have a particular example in mind where um, do you? It's a good question. I mean, I'm just thinking about this, but things that come to mind, like Hugging Face has taken on the aggregation of machine learning data sets and models. And I know that's been very helpful for a lot of folks in that domain. Um, I like okay. the example of the clinical trials, where that's something where kind of standardization can have a lot of value. But I think you're right too, that like you need a community for this um like it's not just a link you know adding links to different things like oftentimes there's work to kind of uh, aggregate too we have still time for more questions actually i do have another question so while you were presenting, <clears throat> and also you were mentioning like the open data promise, I was thinking like data reuse is something positive. And I think data reuse, it brings value to the work of making data uh, available, making it open, making it free. Uh, but it, maybe this is an assumption that cannot be taken in every, in every scenario. Like there are bad reuses of open data. And I'm thinking about, uh, machine learning models that are trained with uh, biased data sets and then the, the accuracy of results, those biases can be even, even harmful. So I was wondering, and maybe this is a bit of question, like, have you considered, or have, can you have some guess of which kind of features, because you have compiled like a really comprehensive list of features, can be helpful to facilitate uh, a bad reuse of data to identify with data set maybe we will be more misleading? Uh, Thanks. Uh, yeah, that's that's a super interesting question. I mean, I guess the, the most obvious answer would be what you uh, what you hinted at in terms of biases or or limitations of a particular data set, and this is also part of, of our list of features that you know this should be part of documentation as much as it should be you know if if the data set is about people, what type of populations, how are they sampled, how are representative are they and for what? Um, so that that's kind of the obvious answer, I would say, to, to attach that information to a data set. Um, I guess the, the less obvious would be um, sort of the hidden structures of a data set that might still impact um, kind of secondary analysis. Uh, that, is, that is done from it. Um, and with this, I mean, as a very basic example, for instance, if you, if you have data collected from a survey, how is the, if, if we don't know, or if we don't consider how a question in a survey, is, an online survey is framed, for instance, we don't know whether there was a, 
a category to say, I don't know, or I don't want to answer this. Sometimes you force people to answer. If this info, this, just to make this more practical, um, if this information isn't attached to a particular column, for instance, subsequent interpretations of that questions might be extremely misleading. Um, and I think these types of things that are super specific and super practical and, and that depend a lot on the type of data collection, these would be interesting to kind of tease out a little bit more. And this is different for machine learning data than it is for qualitative data than it is for type of uh, for survey data. Um, and so I think actually it would be interesting to look at different data types in, in that sense. In this, in, in here, I mean research methods really in a little bit more detail. Um, but then, as my example, it becomes extremely detailed. Um, so, so yeah, that would be my my long winded answer to say I think I think it's complex, and I think it's it's hard to make these sort of general purpose statements on the level that we look at in the literature. And this is why a lot of the the other types of literature that exist is so domain specific. It's about how do you know how do we extract uh, describe experiments. Um, in detail uh, from the, the the instruments that have been used to when they were last calibrated with 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 which um, measures with with which margins of errors um, and so on, um, and then it 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 kind of becomes uh, endless. Um, but even there, to look at you know what what is the stuff that impacts reuse in a measurable way, sort of what we looked at. And the other thing is what are what are the, I'm, I'm lacking the right word, what are sort of the, the things that impact reuse um, that, that might not be measurable? What are the errors that um, kind of go, go on um, if we if we don't mention them, and I think this is not what we looked at in this work, but it would be super interesting to to look at that further, or, or if you know any work there, um, that'd be cool. Thank you, Ivan. Okay, uh, so we are almost now almost out of time. So if there are no further questions, so thank you again. Uh, let's wrap up the session, uh, Emily. Thanks, Pablo. Um, so yeah, this was a really interesting session. Um, big thanks again to both Benjamin and Laura for your presentations today. Uh, I'd like to acknowledge that this showcase was made possible thanks to a coordinated effort um, between myself, Pablo, as well as our colleague Diego, who unfortunately couldn't join us today. Um, thanks to Pablo for taking questions from the community, uh, Emerald for AV support, uh, as well as Janet for coordinating um, support <clears throat> internally. Um, we'd like to thank everyone from the community um, who is able to view the session today um, and everyone who commented in the YouTube chat. Uh, our next showcase will be March 15th and it will focus on gender and equity on Wikipedia and it's in honor of Women's History Month. Um, so we hope that some of you can join us there. And I'd like to also remind you to stay tuned for updates about the 10th edition of Wiki Workshop, which again will be taking place in May. <clears throat>